Hello everybody, welcome to Blue Marble Science, and welcome to part two of Quantum Eraser and Nathan Oakley's Five Fallacious Flat Earth Claims. As we resume, QE and Nathan are going to become surface-to-air missile experts, Coriolis effect connoisseurs, and empty-headed space deniers, you know, the usual. Please note that facial and monitor damage alert remains in effect. So keep those oven mitts on, keep the monitor back out of punching range, and Gladys, <coughs> we're going to need more wood. The next one. See, I really like this one because this son's cabal tards off the reservation. They lose their minds over this one, man. And I... I I really like it. I, I like this proof. Again, it's really simple once you break it all down. So it's the Navy Sea Sparrow missile. And specifically, it's the Evolved Sea Sparrow missile. And it's the Block 1. OK? The Evolved Sea Sparrow missile Block 1. Now, here's a picture of it. Uh, a couple things here that I want you guys to recognize. Number one, in my calculations below, I have this is 80 feet above sea level. Now, listen, if, if this is if, if if this contraption right here, which is the target illumination radar, we're going to get that here in a minute. If this target illumination radar radar is 80 feet above sea level, then I'm a mile mile fighter pilot because that's not 80 feet, but I used 80 feet for the calculations below. If that I'll tell you what, I would I would pretty much guess that's about 50 feet. What do you what do you think about that, Nathan? You think I'm off the reservation with that? I've got a pretty good idea what, what 80 feet is and how high one of these ships are. I've seen them visually. I've been next to them when they're docked. But I did stay at a Holiday Inn Express last night. And no, they're not the height of a cliff. Right, exactly. I'm saying 50 feet. I think that that's pretty fair. So you really don't know what the height of the radar is and you're going to take a guess at it. Nah, that's okay. We'll just speed through this part. They okay, must so be I'm just going to, just for the sake, ship. sorry to interrupt again. Just for the okay. sake of the audience, I'm going to dumb it right down. Who could possibly be better at that job than Nathan? So, target. That bit I'm not going to break down because we all know what a target is illumination in other words that little contraption that john's just put his mouse over is going to illuminate or as john phrased it a second ago paint so when john says paint he means literally paint the target put a light onto the target so like a blob of paint we're gonna light or illuminate that target with the radar Exactly. Sorry, to, sorry to dumb it down so much, but I want it to be absolutely clear what's happening here. That thing looks at the thing you're targeting and puts a little dot on it. Simple as. It doesn't put a dot of anything on the target, Nathan. It sends out a narrow beam radar pulse, and that radar pulse will reflect off the target. When the missile is launched, it simply follows those reflected radar waves to the target. That's simple enough. You know, there's a difference in dumbing it down and just getting it wrong. No, it must see it. <laughs> it has to see the target. This laser has to see that target. In other words, it's in in fact, it's called line of sight, right? Target has to be line of sight, as of an old documentation. Oh, great! Now, idiot number two wants in on the act. Qe. This thing is not laser guided. This is a radar guided missile. You've got radar guided missiles and laser guided bombs confused. This comes from navaltechnology.com. Read it for yourself. The Sea Sparrow surface to air missile is equipped with an improved semi active radar homing guidance system. It's not a laser. Which military did you say you served in? How far is the horizon away at 50 feet tall? Well, it's about eight and a half miles. So this 
weapon system should only have a max effective range at this height for surface targets at eight and a half miles. There's a problem. The range is more than 35 miles, right? At 80 feet, the horizon's like 10 and a half miles. Well, that's a lot less than 35 miles. And remember, this is what the Navy says 35 miles, right? Well, the official max effective range of this weapon system is classified. They only give you 35 miles. So this isn't the real one. It's at least this far. No, no, I'm not. You're trying to equate the range of the rocket with the range of the radar. Nowhere ever does it say that you're going to see a surface target 50 kilometers away. Read it right there, QE. The propulsion system provides the missile with a speed of over Mach 4 and a range of more than 50 kilometers. That's great if you're shooting at an aircraft or a missile that's a thousand feet in the air. It's not going to work for a surface target, and nobody ever says that it does. The target is illuminated with a two-degree RF pencil beam, which has to be maintained or painted on the target until detonation. At a more than generous 80 feet above sea level, level, the target illumination radar height, that's what we're talking about here, target illumination radar height, the target should be hidden behind 385 feet of curvature. So, please explain how you can have line of sight 35 miles away on a spinning ball by showing how a two degree RF pencil beam can penetrate 385 feet, that's 117 meters of target hidden height, through a wall of water 24 miles in length. So that's the deal, huh, fellas? You take the range of the rocket motor itself, which is 35 miles, and then falsely claim that the radar can see 35 miles across the surface of the ocean. Is that all you got? I pulled up this website called Science Direct. I thought it was pretty interesting because, let me go down here to the bottom, there's a chart down here that gives us um, ranges for various types of targets. And you see height above sea for X-band radar and S-band radar. They've got shorelines listed. They've got really big ships, 5,000 ton ships. You can see 11 miles away, nautical miles. Smaller ships, 500 uh, ton size ships, eight nautical miles. But a small vessel, say 10 meters without a radar ref reflector, an X-band radar can see it 3.4 nautical miles away, S-band only three nautical miles away. That radar system for the Sea Sparrow missile cannot see any further than this chart says. So I thought I'd find maybe something else that we could look at. Garmin makes marine radar and they've got a nice video that talks about radar range. Listen to it. One more thing, when most people are looking at buying a radar, they want to know its max range. Well, okay, our open array radars, for example, with their narrow beams and their focused energy, support display ranges out to 72 nautical miles. Now, does this mean you're gonna see another boat 72 miles away? Regrettably, no. Marine radars have a horizon too, just like your eyes. You can calculate this distance by measuring the height of your radar off the water, taking the square root of that number and multiplying it by 1.22. As an example, let's take a center console boat with a T-top. And let's say the radar is nine feet off the water to keep the math simple. Square root of nine is three, three times 1.22 is 3.66. The radar's horizon, its limit of sight, is 3.66 miles away. However, we also have to take into consideration the height of the target off the water. So in theory, if your radar was looking at another center console that had an overall height of nine feet, you could add another 3.66 miles to our distance for a total of just over seven miles. The Navy never says that the Sea Sparrow missile can attack a surface vessel at 50 kilometers, nor does any reference. Garmin even gives you a brand new formula you can misuse that tells you what the radar range to the horizon is for a given antenna height. All you're doing is misrepresenting the range of the missile as the range of the radar to try to twist that to fit your narrative. I think we've heard about enough. I said one of my favorite proofs. I don't bring this proof up to people 
uh, to Joe Blows and uh, uh, Betty Breadmakers. I just don't because they're so indoctrinated. The moment I say Coriolis effect to anybody, I know what they're thinking. Hurricanes. That's all they, I know that's what they do. They think a hurricane. So I got to start off at, at, at step zero, try to get them out. We're going to talk about this hurricane fiasco here at the end, by the way. But I, I don't really bring this up to Joe Blows or Betty Birdmakers. Don't do it. Uh, it's, it's a waste of time. But it's one of our favorite arguments. And it's really quite simple. So again, for the Coriolis effect to exist, you must have, that is necessary condition. Must means necessary. Two differing frames of reference. One rotating coordinate system, that's non-inertial. That's the Earth. And one non-rotating coordinate system, inertial. That's the atmosphere and everything in it. From Seagar Douglas, Introduction to Ocean Sciences. This is a university-level textbook. The Coriolis Effect. When set in motion, freely moving objects, including air, that's atmosphere, and water masses, clouds, water vapor, move in straight paths while the Earth continues to do what? Rotate independently. Here's your citation, QE, unedited. It says, when set in motion, freely moving objects, including air and water masses, move in straight paths while the Earth continues to rotate independently. No place in there does it say atmosphere or clouds or water vapor. You added that stuff. Now, what are you trying to do, Huey? Mislead people? Sorry, that was a rhetorical question. Because freely moving objects are not carried with the Earth as it rotates, they are subject to an apparent deflection called the Coriolis effect. To an observer rotating with the Earth, freely moving objects that travel in a straight line appear to deflect, to travel in a curved path on the Earth. Why do they appear? Well, because you're on the rotating coordinate system. The object that's appearing to curve is not. That's why it's appearing to curve. So A, what's rotating? Well, the Earth's rotating, according to their narrative. And B, what's moving independent of the rotating Earth? Well, the atmosphere. Not no, QE. Hell no. Now we see why you were so desperate to substitute the word atmosphere for air masses. The atmosphere does not move independent of the rotating Earth. The atmosphere rotates with the Earth, you dummy. So go ahead now and tell us about airplanes flying east moving faster than airplanes flying west. Can't wait. And every freely moving object in it, that's bullets, planes, balloons, anything not tethered to the Earth. Freely moving objects, like I said, are not carried with the Earth as it rotates. So, taking all that into account, if the Coriolis effect is true, and it is, see the merry-go-round and the ball. We've already done this multiple times. I've even pulled up Wiki and showed everyone this little deal right here. And you can do it on your own. Go to a playground and do it on your own then it's necessary conditions A and B from above, these two conditions, A, the Earth's rotating, the atmosphere isn't, it must be true. So if A and B are true, then a flight from Charlotte, North Carolina to Los Angeles nonstop traveling at 500 miles per hour airspeed with both locations roughly at the 35th degree north latitude, that is, they're both allegedly spinning at roughly 860 miles per hour, should be approximately 1.5 hours. This argument is so ridiculous, QE, it doesn't even deserve a response. And you know, if you weren't dumber than a tree stump, you would know that. But on the other hand, maybe you do. Maybe that's why you substitute your words for the words in your citations and then continue to refer to your words, not what the citation said. Could that be it, Kiwi? P.S. Like I said, hurricanes. Now, I'm going to give you the perfect example of no depth, no scrutiny, no due diligence, blind Wiki Discovery Channel parroting pretender clown Muppets. But before you do, the, this is, but before you do, hold on. 
I just want to get yep. everyone on the same page. You're despicable. Yes, he is, and you'll find out just how despicable in part three when we finish up the Coriolis effect and how that influences our atmosphere and storm systems and then move on to gas pressure in an open system. Well, that's the end of part two, folks. It's going to go a little bit long if we go any further. So I want to thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. They're right down there under the little red arrow. And we'll catch you guys on the next one. Hey, Gladys. Uh -huh. We're out of here.